Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Wendy Ahrens. I am the uh, director for the Center for the Arts and Society. I'm also a faculty member in the School of Drama. Um, and I want to start by thanking our partners in programming this evening's event. Um, first of all, the Studio for Creative Inquiry. Thank you very much to Harrison Apple, Nick Ross, Bill Rogers, uh, who is always amazing in helping us plan these events, um, uh, for all of the work that they do to welcome us into the space. Um, and to help us set up food and Anastasia for doing the videoing. I just thank you. Thank you all. You guys make it really easy. Um, I also want to thank our co-sponsors, the Humanity Scholars Program and the Sustainability Initiative, and my partner in crime, John Rubin, who has been helping um, to set up all of these events that we do here um, and is just lovely to work with. Um, and last, but certainly not least, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Ziad Adama, who is the owner of Alibaba. Alibaba provided the food. They're down on Craig Street. If you liked it, give them your business. Uh, they're amazing. So the Center for the Arts and Society is a faculty research center that is dedicated to the exploration of the arts as they relate to and involve the larger society. Tonight's event is um, part of an ongoing project within CAS to help integrate and welcome scholars at risk into our community. So for the last two years, we've programmed uh, several of these dinner and a movie events um, that have been curated by Habib Sarosh, who is in the back over there, and um, uh, Reem al Ghazi, and also Anwar Rahmani, all of whom are scholars at risk in our community. Um, and I want to, uh, and, uh, excuse me. So, I want to take the opportunity, sorry, I don't usually do this on my phone. I want to take the opportunity to call attention to a new program um, under which, thanks to generous support from the provost here at CMU, um, we're establishing ongoing support for artists and scholars at risk, ASAR, um, with plans to uh, sponsor one new artist or scholar each year to come to CMU to work and pursue their creative or scholarly activities in a safe and supportive environment. This program is open right now for nominations and self-nominations. So if you're someone in our community, a faculty member, student, uh, or a faculty member who's interested in nominating and mentoring an artist or scholar at risk, or a student who knows of a scholar or artist at risk and wants to let them know about this program, please uh, go to the Center for the Arts and Society website, CAS, just Google it on the CMU website, and you'll find more information there under the ASAR tab. Um, and we're very excited about this program, and we're hoping to have somebody uh, new join our community in the fall. So on to the introductions for tonight. Our film tonight has been curated by Reem al -Ghazi. Reem, can you stand up, please? Reem is a, uh, yes. Reem is a filmmaker and writer from Syria who originally came to CMU in 2023 as a fellow with the Artist Protection Fund. She's currently a master's student in the Global Communications program. We screened her film Becoming Iphigenia in the fall of 2023, and since then she's curated a couple of other screenings um, of films by Syrian filmmakers. And tonight she has invited filmmaker Zaina Al-Khawaji to join us for a brief discussion before the film, uh, Sugar Cage, which is Zaina's film. And then after the film, there will be a brief Q&A that's moderated by Reem. Uh, Zaina Al-Khawaji is a Syrian filmmaker who's based currently in Brussels. She obtained her master's in documentary filmmaking in 2017 in Brussels, and Sugar Cage is her first feature-length documentary that she directed and co-produced in 2019. So we're going to have a conversation with Zaina to, uh, for about 25, 30 minutes. Then we will screen the film. It's about an hour, and then there will be a Q&A afterwards. And I'm going to hand things over to Reem. Thank you, everybody. Good evening. And please join me to welcome Zaina Kahwaji. Thank you. Hello, everybody. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Hi, Reem. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. I'm really excited to share my film and speak to you. So thank you for this uh, nice opportunity. You are very welcome, darling. <laughs> okay, uh, so let me start uh, immediately so we don't take uh, too much time uh, as it's very late. Uh, this film, this film has been shot over a long period of time, several years, as far as I know. Can you tell us for how long and what was happening in Syria during that time? What's the context? political and social context, I mean, background. Yeah. Uh, 
the background of the film. I know there will be some segments, radio segments uh, uh, in the film. We will hear some things during the film, but we would like to know more from you about the background. Yes, sure. Actually, um, I started to film, or let's say to uh, to make some footage uh, by just a small handicam for my uh, for my personal life. Uh, this started in 2012. Uh, this was one year after uh, the Syrian revolution had started in 2011. At that moment, it was, uh, I think I was really living this moment like many other Syrians, where we were holding our best, you know, like looking forward to see some change, while our reality actually was turned upside down. Like uh, what started as a revolution, we wanted a little bit more rights, more, uh, more, uh, let's say, uh, rights of exhibitions in the country. It started to be totally something else, and now we are living in a war zone. Our life is uh, deteriorating. The country is falling apart, and now um, the whole context is different. So actually, I found myself, like many, living this uh, dangerous moment. I stuck in, uh, in my home with my family. Uh, electricity is uh, less than ever, shortage of water. Um, everything you can live under a war situation. While this war was a little bit or uh, like lots of absurdity in there because you don't understand it very well. So uh, what we will see in the film is how did we live this time with, with my family inside my home. But at the same time, I think it reflects what was happening outside, which was normally a battlefield for the Syrian regime while shelling, bombing some rebel rebelling uh, neighborhoods. And some other time you can see that the, also this is a war which is now international. It's not only about uh, some people who wanted some more rights in their uh, in their own country. So I think at some point it's reflecting it's reflecting what we are living outside, but from a totally personal interview, uh, sorry, personal uh, point of view. So this is the context. Uh, I filmed that between 2012 and 2019 when I produced it. So, um, yeah, uh, you can remind me if I missed something. No, that was it. Thank you. Okay. Um, also, I would like to um, clarify another thing. Uh, we are actually, these questions to clarify many points that you you will need before watching the film. So you will understand exactly why this is like this. So uh, another point is that recently I have watched many Syrian films and I noticed that all of them have this slow or stillness aspect like your film. Why do you think is that? Is it the trauma? Is it a specific characteristic? What is it? Actually, it could be, but um, I will talk about it from a personal point of view, let's say from my uh, film perspective. So from, for, for my for my film, maybe you will notice after you watch, you watch to, uh, tonight, that over, let's say, nine, nine years of filming this, this film, you slightly feel that there is something different in this life. And basically that reflects how we, as generations, we were feeling like this is our feelings towards our country that we love. But at the same time, we we mainly felt always that we are stuck some at some moment, that the time has been stopped for us and that our stories, our decision was confiscated. So now, you live every day their life and and your life is gonna be basically like the generation who lived before you like it's the same there's nothing uh changing 
So I think from my film perspective, at least that's the feeling I wanted to put there. This heaviness of time you are living, nothing is changing. You are trying your best. There is no hope. And uh, you feel that you are doomed in this in this uh, lifestyle. And uh, I think it's a very uh, basic and very important uh, feeling that Syrians lived and they wanted to express in their work. This is my opinion, or this is my perspective too. Yes, you are right. I think. So I actually, I actually wanted, I actually wanted to, I actually wanted people to leave that through my images, through waiting, through uh, experiencing. All this that you are waiting uh, tomorrow maybe is something is happening, but but nothing is really arriving. You are only uh, frozen in time and in space. And actually, to add just one more thing, sorry. Uh, this is this is after making the film. Then I noticed that it's not only my life; it was also the feeling that uh, the generation of my parents also lived. So this is this is it. Okay. Well, apart from darkness, stillness, and all that, um, can you tell us if you have a for the future any new projects? Actually, um now I am in, in Brussels. I live a different life. I am, I call it exile, where I choose to, to be. Uh, my story is totally, my reality, let's say, is totally different. And uh, what I want to focus on as an artist is personal, personal stories and personal uh, uh, perspectives. I believe in that. So I think now the most, uh, the big concern for me now is uh, how we people who come this long way, now we are trying to communicate. I think I am concerned about communication, how we are trying to reflect through our stories and how we are trying to live, uh, to live and communicate with the new societies, to express who we are, what we want to be, how we want to, um, I don't know, like continue this this journey. Uh, so I'm looking now for stories to talk about this concept. So hopefully we'll do it one 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 day. Okay, thank you for now. And without further ado, let's start watching the film. I bet okay. the first question ever for you. What was the reaction of your parents <laughs> when they saw the film? Uh, actually, my mom was very scared of the film, so she didn't watch it at first. She knew that uh, the film was out there, screened around. Um, but uh, later I could convince her and she was really uh, very surprised, honestly. she. She was taken in the moment and she was telling me, I don't believe that I lived all this. I just don't believe it. My father was the, the biggest uh, uh, like uh, supporter for me for, for, for always doing uh, films and stuff. So he was very happy. Uh, any questions for Zina? Hi, how are your parents doing now? They are good. They are good, thankfully. I'm very happy they are uh, they are uh, managing. They are still living in Damascus, but uh, yeah, uh, my brother is there, is keeping uh, keep taking care of them. So I'm thankful for that. Thank you for asking. Your father seemed uh, like indifferent most of the time. He has something to do. Was he really feeling that way? 
Well, actually, it was just a question for me too. Uh, and I think it's, um, he never talked about it, honestly, like I asked him uh, a few times. He never, sorry, he never talked about it. I think it, it is a mechanism of defense that he just want to cope with the reality, which is really difficult, and he don't want his family to worry, you know, like it's his way to keep us feel, feel uh, safe and supported. I think so. So it was a question for me actually in this film. Like while it was while I was recording, I was also observing my parents. And you know when you do like videos and then try to to look at them and then construct them as a, as a story, you rediscover who are these people you are belonging to. So yeah, this is what I think. But he never told me. Hi, um, I wanted to thank you for filming this and sharing it with us. Um, my question is, did you feel like there were any any moments that happened that you were not able to film that you wish that you could have captured on camera um, and you felt like it could maybe contribute to the film in some way? Yes, of course. Actually, many moments I couldn't be there. To, to capture and they were really essential for me. But in the end of the day, uh, in this situation, <laughs> it's nine years. I am I am trying to film what I can, and uh, we don't all the time have the good conditions. Sometimes you just uh, don't have any source of light. Sometimes I am just I was depressed and uh, I didn't want to just open my camera and and observe this reality anymore. So. Yeah, but I don't think there is something I regret because uh, I'm happy at least I could do some sort of a story to express at least my story through what I could uh, film. So, yeah. Hi again. Did you have the idea of doing the film, uh, doing a film from the very beginning? Or was it that you got a, a couple of years into it and then you realized that you had enough footage to make a film? How did that work? Yeah, actually, not at all. Uh, in the beginning, it was just, uh, you know, I'm observing my reality through a very, uh, very uh, simple handicap. And for me, it was just archive, like uh, more, than, uh, more like a personal family archive I wanted to keep. Later, and especially actually after I finished my master's, um, so I started filming this, uh, this footage in 2012. I graduated in 2017. Every time I, I go back home for a vacation or something, I was still filming. Um, at some moment, I just tried to watch all the footage I have, and I, I was, I was uh, really uh, intrigued like uh, to do something out of them. I thought uh, it deserved at least to, to tell my story through them. But uh, yes, no, actually in the beginning, it was just something I, I am doing for personal thing, you know. But after also I studied, I know more, I started to know more how, how, how could be important these personal stories. I see. My name is Oliveira, and this is really emotional for me because I lived through war, similarly to you. But what I appreciate so much is how you portray this side of war when you're with your family, the mundane life and its beauty, like in everyday things, and how we, despite what's happening outside of our doorsteps, we have to eat. We have to talk, we have to wash our dishes. So I found that beautiful and the most moving, especially when your dad is fixing um, things or when they're cleaning, roasting and cleaning chestnut. That's like poetry for me. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy, uh, happy you could uh, um, yeah, receive this uh, feeling. Hi, Zaina. Thank you so much for this film. 
Um, I, uh, I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about your choice of how you positioned yourself in this film. I was very aware that you were behind the camera. I was kind of frustrated that I never got to see you in this film. I could hear your voice. Um, and I'm just, I'm curious for you to talk a little more about how you are in this film and also not in this film and what that is for you as an artistic choice. Yeah, thank you. Actually, uh, it was a struggle for me, or to be honest, to, to choose to be in this film or just behind the camera. And uh, during filming, like, it's a little bit personal that I don't like to film myself, but at the same time, uh, it's about the story. Because in the beginning, I thought I'm just observing the reality. I It's, it's not about me. So I wasn't filming, uh, you know, intentionally to do a film later. So I didn't think about it. I started to think about it only to the end, let's say, uh, the last couple of years. And then I found out that uh, actually I didn't exist in the beginning, but but I felt that I exist in some way, you know, like my voice is there. The interaction with my parents is there. So you can't feel me, but you are not really seeing me. And actually when I tried it, uh, I tried it while I was editing. Uh, I tried some choices to, to, to use some footage while I'm there and it wasn't really nice for the... I think it wasn't really nice for the atmosphere of the film or the, the rhythm. Let's say I didn't find that it is adding anything uh, for 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 the to complete the story I wanted to say. So so I think it's a, just a choice uh, you 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 make depending on the process and what is the best for the film. Um, but it's still my reality. It's still my story. It's still you are watching this reality through my lens so it's through my eyes so it's my story and it's my point of view i think so i am kind of uh also for this uh, for this uh reality or the way i construct it uh, of course i try my best to be as as uh, as objective as i can be but also i don't believe in that because in the end it's very subjective what we are doing as artists right Hi, thank you again for the film. It was amazing. Um, my family and I are also from Surya, so it like was really great to see, especially how you portrayed the family love. It reminds me so much of my parents too. Um, so I wanted to ask how your parents felt when you moved away from Surya. Yeah, it wasn't actually, it was very difficult. And for my mom, she was never uh, happy about this decision. She tried her best uh, uh, to convince me the other way while my father for example was always encouraging me to go out just go out from here find your future do something and it's uh, it's always uh, <clears throat> representing how really families were dealing with that we were really torn uh, <clears throat> excuse me i'm a bit sick so actually i think uh, the decision of leaving is will never be something you do while you are happy to do in such a situation because in the end of the day you are leaving behind everything you belong to everything you 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 grew up to know and everything you love and of course to to leave uh, the family behind you is something very big i think especially many syrians as you know they used simply don't have the right to go back right like they don't have the right to go back home or to to see their families because they are, let's say, uh, uh, wanted or something, or it's dangerous simply. So, yeah, it's um, so I think families are uh, are never are never really. Uh, I I I don't think they will be happy, you know, to see you going and leaving. But in the end of the day, parents are always uh, wishing the best for their children. So I think this was also the 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 attitude of my family too. So even my mom nowadays is fine, is happy that I made this choice because she thinks it's it was for the best. Zena, um, as we all have noticed about ourselves, when a camera is turned on us, we become self-conscious much more than just an audio recorder. 
we shift differently, we move differently, we guard ourselves. Did you notice that when you turned on the camera, because obviously there were many, many hours when the camera was not on, when you turned it on, they did any of that? Did they shift? Did they change? And what did you do to get over that besides just continuing to do it and see if they relaxed? Yeah, actually, I am I am very attached to my parents. Um, we have a very good relationship, and I am thankful for that because it was a very important element to help me make this film. And uh, part of um, this relationship, like I, I always used to take photos for my parents since I was young, you know. So uh, holding a camera around at home was something very usual, something very normal. <laughs> And uh, for me, also, when I started to take uh, this footage, they knew that it was for personal archive, like just we as a family doing something personal about our life. So they didn't really question it, you know? She is making videos, as she is always doing. They never imagined that it will be a film. And actually, when I told them that, hey, there is a film about our life is going to be screened soon, they didn't take me seriously even, you know? like. Okay, who is gonna watch this film? Who is really interested to to watch these two old people uh, who live somewhere in Damascus? You know, so it was also a very big surprise for them to to see later that people really watching and appreciating and relating to this story. So no, they, I think um, I think my relationship. I don't know if I answered. Uh, your question precisely, but my relationship with my parents is strong, so it helped me really to have this spontaneous, <laughs> spontaneous, you know, like spontaneous atmosphere with them. So they are not really so self conscious about it after a while anymore. Um, I just wanted to ask what influenced the name of your film for Sugar Cane? Thank you very much for this question. Actually, actually, uh, when I finished the film, I was very hesitated. I didn't know what I'm going to name it. it. Just by accident, I, uh, I found uh, just uh, a food, you know, like it was uh, a food that... Uh, the the generation <laughs> excuse me the generation of my parents they used to eat like uh, and it was actually a metal cage uh, covered with sugar inside the cage there is a little sugar bird so what used they used to do actually is to buy this candy and they had to eat the sugar so they can reach the bird inside this metal little uh, cage and then they eat the sugar and they keep the metal cage they 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 collect them you know and this was for me very weird idea <laughs> like to do that for a child you know like what type of food is this so it was also a little bit simple for me because i'm making this film about home about belonging about uh, this is sweet feeling you feel to inside this home, the warm, everything. But at the same time, at some point, this home can be just the cage that uh, prison you and uh, blocking your uh, future. So, yeah, so I saw this food and I, uh, it's, it's, we name it sugar cage basically. So I just give it to my film as a name. Zaina, again, thank you um, for this film. It's many um, images will stay with me. Uh, number one, the tenderness between your parents and the tenderness they felt towards you and that you reflected back to them. And then the image of the pressure cooker um, was so emblematic of what was going on and the droplets of water on the um, clotheslines, just getting ready to fall. Um, just such beautiful images. Um, 
But what I'm wondering about is, would that have been captured any differently if you had been making this movie before the war? Mm. Well, good question. <laughs> I, uh, I really don't know, but uh, uh, yeah, actually, I think I think uh, living such times had had a big influence because uh, living such times you start to be more sensitive about the beauty in your reality that you don't really see every day when you are safe and you are happy and you are fine, right? So I really don't know if if it would be the same, but I would say the danger I was living like many other Syrians, the uh, fear of losing uh, my country, my family, my life, all influenced me to see more attentively or to be more sensitive towards even the little details around me and to appreciate them and to picture that in my friend. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Zaina, for this lovely evening and for this beautiful film. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for watching. Thank you, for, everybody. Uh, telling me your. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank Have you. Have a nice evening. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye.